Hey, Chan, how are you doing? You're calling from Shreveport, Louisiana, and called in about miracles and stuff. Um, how can John and I help you? <laughs> hey, Matt. Hey, John. Hey, Chan. Um, just wanted to, um, last week we were talking about this, the concept of miracles, and you asked a question, and I, and I thought about it a little bit more, and you asked, how could we confirm a miracle? And, and that's a great question. And um, I guess what I wanted to ask you is, what do you mean by confirm? I think we kind of talked about this earlier. Um, so there, there's two, two parts to this. One, you would need to be able to reasonably confirm that the event happened, you know. Okay. Um, hey, my, you know, my uncle lost his arm in the war, and we have all the records for this, and the doctors, and, you know, we've got video evidence, and we've seen him, and now he has an arm that has just grown back. And since okay. that would definitely fit as something that we would generally identify as a miracle, then I think that we could reasonably confirm that the event happened. The second question is, how do you then explain the event? How do you get to what caused his limb to miraculously grow back? And for that, okay. I, I can't give you um, a clear way to confirm it because it's the sort of thing that I don't see any path uh, to be able to confirm it. Somebody would have to come up with a method by which we could confirm the explanation. Okay. Fair enough. And last last week when I called you, I mentioned the, um, the 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 hypothetical about the beheaded pastor. Do you remember that? Yep. Okay. So, what if I gave what, what I think as as a Christian, I don't think we should automatically go right to the miraculous. I I have no problem looking for a natural explanation. So I think that let's I think in order to call something a miracle. I think three things have, have to happen. So I'm going to lay this out, and you tell me what you think. Number one, it needs to be a highly improbable event. Number two, it needs to lack a natural explanation. And number three, it needs to have a religious context surrounding it. Why? I, so, so I object to number two and number three. Too. Yeah, okay, John does too, <laughs> so I'll let John object to him. I object okay, to number me, two and number just, three. Okay. Uh, go go just, ahead. <laughs> So, so my, my 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 illustration last week was about the beheaded pastor. There's uh, ISIS comes in in front of the whole congregation. They cut his head off in front of everybody. The coroner comes in. He picks up the head. Uh, they do a blood test. On it. it was definitely he was murdered. He was buried. Sure. Let, and, let, let me let me then, let me pause this, Chan. I I apologize for interrupting you because uh, we don't need to rehash this. Uh, I will okay. say. One point I would like to try to get to before we're done is, why is it every time we talk about this, theists come up with this absolutely bizarre scenario that has never happened and which they can provide no comparable case to a pastor beheaded who comes back to life a little later, uh, a limb growing back. We, we can agree that these sorts of things would certainly lead us that direction, and yet we, okay. sh we can also agree that those things have never happened. But before we get to that... I want, I want John to be able to talk about why he objects to items two and three in your definition. Well, number two, okay, go right ahead. Number, number two, as I recall, had something to do with uh, it, it doesn't have a natural explanation. And that, yeah, it lacks a natural explanation. It lacks a natural explanation, yeah. and that's, that's going into proving a negative territory. So my objection is, how, how would you determine that it lacks a natural explanation? Or, or are you just Not saying you, you can't think of a natural explanation? No, I'm saying that I'm saying not not that you can't think of a natural explanation, but that no natural explanation will work. Okay, so here's here's the problem with that. You've just made your entire thing circular, because in order to say there is no natural explanation, you would need to demonstrate that there's no natural explanation, which means you would have to have to have godlike knowledge of every possible explanation. Now, how do you how do you prove that? All, all your well, all your second criteria is is it has no ex natural explanation is equivalent to is necessarily supernatural. Not, and no, and that's no. yeah, the, those two things are identical. Has no natural explanation is identical to is supernatural. But I think you're you're thinking that I'm getting to the point that the 
if I was to call it a miracle, that I have to get to a hundred percent certainty, and that's not no, necessarily no. Okay. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not worried about 100% certainty. We went by what you just said when John questioned your second criterion. Because okay. to say that it has no natural explanation, um, that is an injection of certainty there. That is an in so, because otherwise you're just simply saying we don't currently have a natural explanation for it. Y your, your definition requires that right. we rule out any possible naturalistic explanation. But well, it's not just it's not just that second point. You, but if I the second all, one's wrong, you, your definition has a problem. That's the point. And and your third one, your third definition that it requires a, some sort of supernatural context. You have religious religious context. Or religious, context. Or religious context. context. Yeah. So so yeah. if you're if so if a person's head was chopped off and came back, but it wasn't a pastor in a church, are you saying that wouldn't be a miracle? Well. <laughs> It, it depends. I mean, yeah, if, if, they, if the person came back... What do you mean it know. depends? If, if no, we're out I, here and a guy walking down the street gets hit by a car and his head rolls off, and two days later he gets back up and there was no religious context to any of it, you're saying that's not a miracle? Well, that probably would be a miracle. Okay, yeah, then okay. your definition of a miracle is flawed. Definitely, you agree, on point three, and we think on points two and three. So we're not going to work with your definition of miracle. Okay, so what definition of miracle are you, would you accept? Because in order to say something is a miracle, we've got to have some kind of definition. And, and all miracles, if they, if they occur, are on a case-by-case -case basis. Sure. People should investigate them on a case-by-case -case basis. That's why there's no set rule to say this is a miracle or this is not a miracle. We have to investigate those claims and see what evidence is brought forth to to say that it's a miracle. Would you agree with that? Yeah, and that's and that gets back to to your uh, number two again is that if you go to investigate, okay, why did this limb grow back? And when you investigate, you come up with some some naturalistic explanation for how this happened. Then uh, do you no longer call it a miracle. Or is it just that you understand something that you didn't understand before? You know, as we get more uh, and more advanced, do, do, do things that were miracles become not miracles anymore? Well, if, and that's by definition, a miracle is a rare event. Okay. It's a rare, but, and so that's why it's investigated. Then miracles are wholly unimpressive, and the only thing that we're concerned about is what is the explanation for miracle? Because there's all kinds of rare events and unlikely events, and if you want to, if right. you want to, if you want to say, I mean, I think the normative definition of a miracle is anything that is unexpected upon our understanding of how the natural world works, something that seems to be in conflict with the natural order. Um, what, I don't even know that there's a discussion of how likely it is, um, because if pastors were being beheaded and coming back to life every two or three days, uh, now it would become a regular event and almost expected, right. and it would still count as miraculous because it's in violation of the natural order. Uh, now, this isn't saying that we, you know, that there isn't, basically this definition of miracle gets to what John was saying. Today, we're going to label this a miracle. We may find out that there's a perfect, perfectly acceptable naturalistic explanation sometime in the future, in which case we would go back and look at this and say, okay, we thought it was a miracle, but it turns out it's actually part of the natural order. We just found something new and unexpected uh, that didn't fit with what we understood. And this is why the whole definition of a miracle, an example of miracle, is secondary to the big claim, which is miracles, first of all, that a miracle has occurred, which I, I see, or a miracle which can be tied to a supernatural cause has occurred. I see no evidence for that at all. It seems like to me that you're moving the goalpost. I'm not moving the goalpost. I'm putting them where they should. It is the people who want to say that because something unusual or rare or unexpected has happened, that therefore they are justified in thinking that a supernatural being has intervened. They have moved the goalposts into the land of gullibility. I am putting them where they should be uh, from an objective status, where we don't begin with the assumption that there is a being who can do this. No, I think as 
a theist, I should look for a natural explanation first. Okay, and so when you don't happens, find one, what do you do then? Well, my worldview allows for a supernatural explanation because I don't think... That okay, I understand, I understand, but what if your worldview allows for fairies? What does that tell me about your worldview? Well, my worldview doesn't allow for fairies, but... But you just allowed for supernatural. Aren't, aren't fairies supernatural? Uh, I guess. Okay, so well, how come you're excluding fairies from your supernatural worldview? I haven't had any evidence of fairies, but okay. I, if someone brings what, what, it, so, so you're excluding them. you're excluding supernatural things that you don't have evidence for. What supernatural things do you have evidence for? What supernatural uh, things do I have evidence for? Yeah. Is that, okay. Um, and this goes back to the classical arguments for God's existence. The and you're very familiar with those. The cosmological argument. Not evidence for the supernatural. It, there's evidence for a cause of the universe. No. And, and that, okay, and, and the, through Big Bang cosmology, we know that the universe began to exist. Actually, we don't know that. We don't know that. And the current, the current trend among scientists is to actually point out that the universe did not have a beginning in space-time, that space-time didn't begin to exist. And that's from Hawking, from, the, from uh, Alan Guth, um, Sean Carroll's talked about it, exposed this when he debated William Lane Craig, because William Lane Craig gets up and says that the bored goof Lincoln model supports his idea that the universe had a beginning and everything else, and Carroll explained why that was all wrong, and then had an actual picture of Alan Guth basically holding up a sign that says, Craig doesn't understand my model and is misusing it, although it had actually different words. So the Kalam cosmological argument is fundamentally flawed, but at the end, the conclusion of the Kalam of the universe having a beginning... A, a, cause, a, cause. a cause, does not mean that the cause is supernatural. Even if it were correct, okay. it would not be evidence for the supernatural. But it's not correct. Okay. That's, so you're, using you're right. it is even doubly wrong. You're right. I can't force you to accept the conclusion of the, the Kalam. Why, why, is the it, why is it, Chan, that it was really simple for you to say your model accepts the supernatural and excludes fairies because you don't have evidence for them? And then when asked, what evidence do you have for the supernatural, you go to this abstract argument, which doesn't actually prove the supernatural and is also flawed. Where's the actual evidence for the supernatural? The, the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, How do you know the resurrection the occurred? You don't get to just cite know. a story in a book and say this is evidence of the supernatural. What did, what did you do with all the other dying and rising saviors that were popular? Did they rise from the dead? Those those are copycats. Okay, how do you know those that? Copy, because I've done some research on it, and I've looked into it, and I've, I've read some of the the writings. Uh, uh, I just I just did I just did an entire debate on the resurrection with Blake Junta in Dallas, um, and then he came down to my house, and we sat on the couch, and we talked about this. Blake okay. Blake acknowledges that in order to conclude that the resurrection occurred, you have to begin with the assumption that the resurrection is something that a God would do. So you have to begin with a God belief and that God would do it. And apart from that, you cannot reach the conclusion that Jesus rose from the dead. So that makes, the, that makes this argument circular. If you're trying to use the resurrection to confirm the supernatural, but you have to accept the supernatural before you can possibly make any sort of argument for the resurrection, then the argument is circular.